Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the third installment of our excellent Ulysses series, brought to us by Mark Schenker. On uh, a beautiful afternoon, and we are obviously big fans of Joyce and of Mark's to be looking at a screen this afternoon, but for an hour, very interesting discussion. I'm Michael Belakoza, Community Engagement Manager at Walton Library. I'm very happy to be introducing this program today. And I just want to remind everyone that your mics and your cameras are off, and please keep them that way for the duration of the program. And you can use the chat box to send me uh, comments or questions that I will relay to Mark at the end. Uh, we always have five or several minutes for that. Uh, and that Mark is also quite happy to respond directly to questions that are emailed to him. And if you'd like to do that, I can easily pass along his email address. So with that, I will turn this over to Mark. Thank you, Michael. And thank you and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna do a very brief recap of what I hope was covered in the first two lectures, very brief, uh, both for people who haven't attended yet and for those of you who might appreciate uh, the uh, uh, review. So uh, we've talked about how Stephen, as a self-consumed artist is insufficient as the vehicle of the novel, whereas Bloom is an other directed businessman. Uh, in book 10, uh, the first of the episodes we'll be touching on today, Lenahan, who appears also in Dubliners, characterizes Bloom as a cultural all-round man, all one word. Uh, that is, all-round man is all one word. And adds, there's a touch of the artist about old Bloom. Touch of the artist is a kind of Irishism, and he's not being sarcastic. He recognizes that in his humanity, Bloom represents a kind of artistic empathy to the world around him. I've cited how the ultimate value of life is encounter, engaging with other people as persons equivalent to yourself. I don't know if I've cited in one of these lectures, but I often cite a, a music hall entertainer who said, uh, we're here to help other people, but what the other people are here for, God only knows. Uh, Joyce wants the other people to be uh, on our radar for reasons other than our helping them, for other, other than using them for our own purposes, even if our purposes are charitable. In Dubliners, published in 1914, a work that I enthusiastically recommend to you if you haven't read it and you wish to have a better understanding of Joyce. If I were teaching a course in Joyce as I have, uh, I would do all of Dubliners with care. I would do all of Portrait and I would only do selected uh, chapters of Ulysses in the interest of time. So in that work, Dubliners, the social condition that afflicts the citizens of the Irish capital is paralysis, a word that one of the children, one of the boys in the story is fascinated by the sound of it. Stagnation, a failure of the various citizens of all generations to venture out physically, socially, emotionally. By contrast, Ulysses celebrates going out, going about, doing what Virginia Woolf called in her single Day in June city novel, Mrs. Dalloway, which was published in 1925, just three years after Joyce's novel, we must take the plunge into life as we find it. And she uses a diving metaphor because Mrs. Dalloway remembers the freedoms of summers when she was younger and diving into the water. And that idea of plunging into life has resonance in the novel, Mrs. Dalloway, in other ways that I'll let you discover on your own. Uh, and so this idea of venturing out and about is a non-trivial way in which Joyce's epic resonates with Homer's. Odysseus, remember I'm recapping now, uh, despite being a king loved by his people and his family, cannot achieve his potential staying at home he must, to use Robert Fagel's apt verb in his translation of the opening of the Odyssey, launch out. If home 
is to have its full value and significant in our lives. For Joyce, we must leave it in order to be able to return to it. An example of the ultimate detour. And again, I've used that line, longest way round is the shortest way home, and the idea of detour for this lecture because that's how I teach Joyce. Even all the artistic and rhetorical devices, the headlines, the musical styles, the uh, having the English language developed in the way that the fetus in Mrs. Purefoy's body has uh, developed during gestation. All of those elaborate designs are detours to bring us back to the essential elements of the novel that I've been underscoring. As I stressed last time, the power of Ulysses did not inhere in any grand scheme, not even in its resonances with the Odyssey. Uh, if Joyce was serious about uh, those labels for every one of these chapters and the elaborate, every chapter has an organ, every chapter has a color, uh, it, it's really, uh, I think, excessive. But if he were serious about that, uh, he would have them in the printed volume show up with each chapter, which is how they appeared when he published it in serial form in the little review, but he didn't carry it over to the full novel. So it doesn't inhere uh, the power of a novel in any grand scheme, but rather in the small details of everyday life. What Wolf calls the swing, the tramp, the trudge of living, that despite its matter of factness is created every moment afresh. One of the things that happens after the great war uh, of the 19 teens is that artists and intellectuals started thinking not about the great things, but the small things, not about the great society, a phrase that existed before Lyndon Johnson made use of it, but the small society. Um, and so this becomes important to the writers between the wars about the intimacy of social sets, which can extend to a city or a people, but not abstractly grand or worldwide, uh, again, in the abstract sense. So uh, E.M. Foster said famously that if he were given the choice to betray his country or betray, betray his friend, he would hope he'd have the courage to betray his country because a person who would betray a friend that he knows instead of a country that he can't possibly hold in his head uh, isn't honorable. Uh, this is a shift in the way people are thinking about their relationship to the world. The first war, the great war, uh, crushed a lot of people's hopes for greatness of any kind. So those of you who heard my Odyssey lectures earlier this year may recall how much is made in that poem about the simple facts of hospitality, the offering of food or the providing of a bed, even the way a bed is made up. Throughout your and for me, that's one of the great joys of the Odyssey. We remember it because of Cyclops and the Sirens and the kind of comic book mythic adventure. There's, there's a lot of uh, uh, thrills and spills in the Odyssey, but what really moves us are the small touches. And I think that's true also in Ulysses, where if we can resist the distraction of looking for grand schemes, we ourselves will encounter the essence of Joyce's recreation of life among the middle-class inhabitants of Dublin on an ordinary day. It's a Thursday, a Thursday in mid-June of 1904. A collection of non-epic events, even calling them events might be overrating them, of social interactions, everyday errands, bodily functions, the swing of emotional and psychological states of mind, and the ever presence of our memories, often activated by some small sensory detail. That's the experience of reading uh, Ulysses. I don't think anyone who reads Ulysses, even if they do it with a guidebook by their side or reading it with uh, an essay on how the Odyssey figures in it, experiences that totality more strongly than they do these uh, small touches, which is what I'm going to continue 
to talk about today and next time. So when I mention uh, memories activated by some small sensory detail, I expect that more than one of you has in mind Marcel Proust, a sentence I don't get to say very often. It was in 1913 that Proust, whose dates are 1871 to 1922, he died eight months after Ulysses was published. It was in 1913 that he published the first volume of his monumental Remembrance of Things Past, now more often called In Search of Lost Time, which had as its theme involuntary memory. And an incident of involuntary memory is enacted early in that first book called Swan's Way, capital S and two N because it's a person's name, which has the famous episode of the Madeleine, uh, biting into a cookie, which uh, sets off uh, hundreds or thousands of pages of recollection. Ulysses is replete with examples of the continual, even continuous interplay between the world outside of us and the rich interior life of our fears and desires, our memories and our anticipations or expectations, our joys and our despairs. And so this brings me to a point I want to make about Ulysses, not only as a novel of its time, the 1920s, a remarkable decade for literature, but as a modernist novel. And this is not a digression to understand broadly how Ulysses functions as a modernist novel uh, will help you with an insight to the novel, whether you're continuing to read it or not. And I wanna say again, my advice to anyone reading the novel outside of a course in which you're going to be evaluated is to skip the parts you don't want to read or that you try to read and can't get through or read them over uh, uh, lightly uh, but I hope that there are at least a third or more of the chapters that really resonate with you and you find accessible. Uh, but however you read it or don't, modernism and understanding of modernism, I think, will help you. In literature, the modernist period is typically seen as that flourishing between the two world wars. And so the 1920s saw a flood of modernist works in English on both sides of the Atlantic. So in addition to Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, and the first English translation of Proust's Swan Way, which came out in 1922, we have D.H. Lawrence's Women in Love. We have William Carlos Williams. You may remember I cited last time his artistic credo, no ideas, but in things, very concrete uh, poetic philosophy. His collection, Spring and All, a uh, very famous collection came out in 1922. T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland also in, uh, in 1922. Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, 1925. Uh, two novels by Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, uh, 1926 and 29 respectively. Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. There's a work that also is very uh, apparently inaccessible to a casual read but as a great example of modernism. So what is modernism about? It does not have to do with the future. It has to do with a contemporary world, that is the world of the 20s and 30s, that saw itself living after the old time, beyond Victorian times, beyond America and the 19th century, in a technological, largely urban, largely godless, um, it's the end of the 19th century that Nietzsche says for more than one person, God is dead. Trying to figure out that being moderns, being sophisticated, knowledgeable, maybe no longer religious, uh, uh, reasonable beings, what is it we're going to embrace? And an important element of the movement, now we're not talking about everyday people on the street, we're talking about artists and intellectuals and academics is a gathering dissatisfaction with the emptiness of contemporary life. In response, many in that group, again, as with all changes, we're not talking about the average person. Uh, when we have a shift and all of a sudden the enlightenment 
and the age of reason seems to be giving way to romanticism, nobody works, wakes up one day and says, oh, I think I'll write an ode to joy. Uh, it happens slowly and it happens typically at the higher uh, edge in terms of literary production, intellectual activity of society. So in response, many of these writers and intellectuals turn to the past and not just the past of their own countries, but the past of culture for a revitalization that they sought in the celebration of the power of the primitive. And if you wish to remember something about modernism, remember that it's an embrace of the power of the primitive. Joyce did not cotton to the revivalism that Yeats and Lady Gregory and other people did about the Irish past of folklore and uh, pre 19th and 20th century culture. He thought that it was empty at the core. He thought that it was not intellectual. He thought that it was nostalgic. He thought that it was indicative of a lot of what was wrong with Ireland, was uh, emotionally soft and not intellectually tough. But he did believe that civilization could help repair itself with a revitalization that was anchored in the past of Western culture and even uh, world culture. So this notion of embracing the power of the primitive, we see this in works as different as Eliot's The Wasteland, a long poem that is animated by the Grail legend and ancient Hindu scriptures like the Upanishads. We see it in Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring, 1913, so a little bit earlier that I'm talking about, a ballet in which pagan rituals are used to convey the power and mystery of the season of spring. What could be more a matter of fact? What could be more every day than the fact that spring comes every year? And yet he uses old myths and rituals to make it new again. If you know the poem, The Wasteland, you may remember that it begins with the line, April is the cruelest month. It begins in the spring and April is cruel in the poem because we're invited to resurrect ourselves from the torpor of winter, but we realize not everyone who went in hibernation with us is coming back. Uh, spring is a renewal, but not for everybody. Uh, we see it also, uses of the primitive, in other modernist works like E.M. Foster's A Passage to India, with something about the Indian uh, society and culture and landscape seems to have uh, a power that the English tourists can't understand. And especially, uh, in, I shouldn't say especially, and in D.H. Uh, Lawrence's novels, especially Lady Chatterley's Lover, published in 1928, uh, like Ulysses Band, but a great celebration of the power of the elemental, of the primitive in the face of modernism, in the face of technology, in the face of the separation uh, between people that inevitably result uh, from urban culture. Uh, the reason the book was banned is in part because it used uh, the F word and other expletives, but not as an expletive. It used it as the actual verb which is not common, uh, I find. Uh, and uh, it's Lawrence's way of saying that Lady Chatterley's lover, who is a groundskeeper for her husband's estate, is a primitive man. And that's part of his salvation. So this notion of uh, a turning to the primitive to help redeem the degradation of the modern, of the contemporary, is a uh, important aspect of modernism. We see it also by the way, in Picasso's decades long fascination with the ethnographic implications of African art, especially sculpture. He wasn't slumming. Uh, he was trying to get some of that uh, mystery and power into his own art. So once again, Virginia Woolf is very instructive here. Unlike Joyce, Woolf wrote extensively and importantly on the issue of modernism and on the novel as an art form. So I'm referring to her here because she's identifying what she and Joyce are doing in a way that Joyce did not 
consigned to regular critical prose. In an essay entitled Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, Mr. Bennett is an old school novelist, uh, Arnold Bennett, Bennett, known mainly for the old wives tale. And Mrs. Brown is Mrs. Anybody. That is uh, Jane Q. Public, uh, Brown, a name like Smith. In that essay of 1924, she declared that on or about December 1910, human character changed. She picked that date partly because it was the date of a post-impressionist exhibition of paintings curated by part of her uh, friends in the Bloomberry Circle in England. And she was talking about how those paintings showed a new way of looking at the world that actually changed the way we thought about culture. So by this, she meant that artists and writers had begun and should continue, it's very much a proscriptive essay, to stop looking out the window at the world of concrete details and instead direct their searching gaze inside to human nature. She's urging the writers to make their novels, their stories, their art interior, uh, which is part of what uh, Joyce is doing in Ulysses. And it's a movement that continues for many decades after the 20s. She addresses her readers directly as to how we experience our own lives as we live them. She says in the essay, you have ever heard scraps of talk that filled you with amazement. You have gone to bed at night bewildered by the complexity of your feelings. In one day, thousands of ideas have coursed through your brains. Thousands of emotions have met, collided and disappeared in astonishing disorder. Now you may think since she's writing that in 1924 that she's cribbing from Ulysses. Not at all. Uh, Wolf uh, and Joyce are fellow travelers. They're both trying to redefine the novel as a way to get to the thisness of life. What is life that makes it this thing? And that idea of scraps of talk that fill us with amazement, being bewildered at night by the complexity of our own feelings, recognizing that in one day, thousands of ideas course through our brains, thousands of emotions move in astonishing disorder is exactly what Ulysses is about. And if you can pull back in your reading of the novel and recognize that what I just read from Wolf is true, it's always been true, but people weren't paying attention to it before. It's a little bit like when I was in a chemistry class uh, when I was a uh, physics and uh, math major back in my uh, early ignorant college days, uh, somebody pointed out uh, that uh, uh, oxygen was discovered in 1789 and someone else wondered what people were breathing before then. Uh, these things about human life were experienced in the 15th century, but people didn't have the wherewithal to think of them that way because the interior life didn't matter. Uh, you didn't have the same register of your own emotions. It's like the changing conception of self. In, uh, pre, uh, in colonial New England, the self was the enemy. The self is what tempted you not to be a, a good Christian. The self was the opposite, the enemy of the soul. And so you will not find Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards uh, and Anne Bradstreet writing about a celebration. Uh, wait, let's remove Anne Bradstreet, not because she's a woman, but because she's uh, not, um, she's a rebel. Uh, you won't find them celebrating the self. Uh, Whitman will do it centuries later because for him, the self is the soul. Uh, changing conceptions of human nature are part of the development of cultural history. So, Alongside the ancient truths that are found in timeless myths and rituals, the modernist novel found a new way of conveying realism. And although there's a lot of the unrealistic and the hyper-realistic in Ulysses, it is first and foremost a realistic novel. As I said in our first meeting, it is much more like other novels than it is unlike other novels. 
Uh, what is a way of conveying realism? It's delving into the interior lives of its subjects. And so character, which is interesting to think about as a name that both means our virtues and personal characteristics, and what we call a representative of a person in a play or a novel or a movie. It, com it comes from a word for stick or stylus with the implication that our character is something that events or providence or fate actually etches into our being uh, that we're written on in a way as compared to the blank slate that Locke talked about, uh, the tabula rasa, uh, that we're only affected by the things we experience in our sensory life. So character was no longer something a writer had to reveal over many months or years of fictional time as the protagonist would meet various obstacles along his or her trajectory. Uh, it showed, in order to show in a matter of speaking, what that character is made of. That's a very typical 19th century novel, many months or years and at the end of a long trial, uh, that is uh, uh, testing of character trial, uh, if the uh, protagonist is not found wanting, uh, Jane Eyre gets her husband, uh, Pip gets his second wife, uh, uh, David Copperfield gets his second wife, uh, somebody inherits a will, this happiness received. Now, if a character, if character exists, in each of us, it must exist all the time. And in the point uh, perspective of Wolf and Joyce, it can be evinced on a single episode and certainly in a string of apparently unrelated episodes in a single day. You are always who you are. Joseph Conrad, secret agent, I think I cited this recently, we never cease to be ourselves. This is at the core of the method of Mrs. Dalloway and Ulysses and countless novels and works of art that follow. And so an embracing of old primitive rituals, myths and truths, even if they are unbelievable or anti-rational or pre-rational or even pre-linguistic, which is part of what Joyce will go on to do uh, with Finnegan's Wake, his last work, uh, which is uh, a work of kind of pre-literature. So an embracing of the old, but a new way of capturing reality with a light on the interior um, details of the human being. There's perhaps no better example of everything I've been saying so far uh, in Joyce's masterpiece than chapter 10, which he entitled the Wandering Rocks. Uh, the Wandering Rocks is not actually narrated or dramatized in Homer's poem. So it's the only episode, the only chapter in Ulysses that has a working title that is not actually an episode in the Odyssey. The Wandering Rocks, a threat to Odysseus's voyage, is cited by Circe in Book 12. But again, it's not narrated or dramatized because uh, Odysseus decides to go a different route. So chapter 10 takes place in the streets of Dublin around 3 p.m., uh, a, a, a time of day like Thursday, the uh, sort of day of the week. Uh, 3 p.m. Is, is not a time typically that is a marker of something significant in terms of people's uh, diurnal rhythms. It's not a meal time. It's not the begin, beginning or the end of most people's work days. I know what bankers hours are, but we're not talking about bankers. It's a kind of matter of fact time. And one of the things Joyce is committed to exploring in the novel is how the typical and the everyday is not banal, is not banal. It, it, it's not boring. It's not lacking in interest, even if it's the kind of thing uh, people do all the time. Attend a funeral, uh, evacuate their bowels, uh, lust after someone they happen to see uh, beachside. So uh, it's constituted of 19 vignettes that enact 19 different points of view. 
Joyce is generous. He actually makes spaces between the vignettes. And if you're OCD as I am, you can number them and make sure you get them all, all 19. But think of it, after the library bound oration of Stephen in the preceding chapter, where he dominates Ulysses for the last time in the novel, in chapter 10, Joyce throws open the doors of his book and puts us out on the street in the full open air of mid-afternoon city life. And chapter 10, of course, is the pivot point between the two halves of the novel. Stephen is tried again, tested out again, in the confines of the library, where he could as easily be talking to himself. He not only goes on and on about his theories, by the end of the chapter, he suggests that he's not sure he's right. Another example of his self-promotion and self-consciousness, his lack of self-confidence. Uh, he's a a kind of oxymoron in that way. So uh, ushering in the second half of the novel is this extraordinary celebration of the symphony of movement of many characters in chapter 10. So at the same time that we're out on the Dublin streets, each vignette is presented from the point of view of a particular person or set of persons with the whole collection keyed to the pedestrian movements of, quote, the very Reverend John Kami S.J., SJ, Jesuit, on the one hand. Uh, he officiated at Digman's funeral. He's actually on an errand to try to get one of Digman's sons into a school for free. So it's an act of charity. So one um, bookend of the, the chapter is this walking around of the Jesuit priest, John Conmey. And on the other hand, the progress by carriage of, quote, the vice regal cavalcade. Uh, he's named near the end of the chapter. Uh, he is William Humble, the second Earl of Dudley, who was King Edward VII's Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. So these two representatives of institutions, the church, capital C, and the state, capital S, respectively, bracket the entire chapter as the priest steps out at the start of the first episode and his excellently, excellency at the end acknowledges the real or imagined salutes of people that his carriage passes uh, in the final episode. Um, they're put at the margins because Joyce is turning his back on two of the powers that he thinks have not only subjugated Ireland, Roman Catholic Irish religion, I'll call it, and the English state not only have oppressed his people, but have threatened his ability as an artist. I mentioned this in the first meeting, uh, that if he wanted to be an artist, he couldn't be restricted by Roman Catholic thinking, which marginalizes or erases a lot of human experience. And although he was writing in the language of his oppressors, I think I mentioned too that uh, Joyce never showed any interest in learning Gaelic. He was not interested in writing or publishing in Gaelic because he thought, seems likely true, that if he wanted to be a great writer, it wouldn't be in Gaelic. So those uh, powers are marginalized and the novel celebrates in the intervening 17 vignettes a range of major and minor characters that we've seen before, or we'll see again, along with a number of folks we might call, to borrow a term from filmmaking, extras. Indeed, there's a very strong cinematic feel to chapter 10. When I've done this novel with undergraduates who have actually read the book, and it's easy, of course, to take a course and fake it, and not read the book. And I, I suspect of the many books I've taught, Ulysses is up there for books written on and students doing well on that they didn't read. But for the students who do actually read the novel, chapter 10 is often one of their favorites. So in the intervening 17 vignettes, we see a one-legged sailor, the dancing teacher of Mr. Magini, Mrs. Breen, who had talked to Bloom earlier about Mrs. Purefoy, Corny Kelleher, who's the undertaker who arranged the Digman funeral, two of Stephen's four sisters in a single vignette, 
Blazes Boylan and his secretary, Miss Dunn, Stephen and separately his father, Simon, both more than once, Martin Cunningham, who we met at the funeral, Buck Mulligan and Haynes, Stephen's unwelcome housemates from the first chapter, the blind stripling, whom Bloom assisted in chapter eight, Lestragonians, and whom we will hear again in book 11, Sirens, where he's cited as a piano tuner in that episode that Joyce constructed as an inventory of musical styles. And Joyce, like many, many citizens of Dublin at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century and beyond, is deeply involved in music. Uh, that uh, Molly is an amateur singer of some renown reminds us that in Ireland at the time, and maybe still, I don't know, there's a very fine line between very good amateurs and typical professionals. Music is part of the lifeblood of Ireland and certainly Dublin. So significantly in the third vignette of the 19, we catch a glimpse of Molly Bloom's arm in the context of the one-legged sailor begging on the street and two of Stephen's sisters are, uh, who are licorice sucking barefoot urchins that are referenced, who are standing near uh, the uh, sold sailor looking at his, we're told, bloody stump. Uh, he shouts out up to the unheeding windows above, he's begging, for England, home, and beauty, uh, citing a song of patriotism. Of course, it's English patriotism because he's not an Irish sailor. So in response to that cry of the one-legged sailor in the company of a couple of Stephen's sisters, this is what Joyce writes. The gay, sweet, chirping whistling within went on a bar or two, ceased. The blind of the window, this is the window above his head, was drawn aside, a card unfurnished apartments slipped from the sash and fell. A plump, bare, generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat bodice and taut ship straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. So we know from a number of markers, including unfurnished apartments, the description of the bodice and ship strap, that that's Molly Bloom, who is in the time zone of her assignation. Her arm is plump, a word that was used in the opening line, the first word of the whole novel about Buck, uh, Buck Mulligan. And her bare arm is generous, not because she's throwing a coin to a beggar, but because she is generous with her body. I'm sure that both those implications are intended. So it fell on the path. One of the urchins, that is one of Stephen's sisters, ran to it, picked it up, and dropped it in the minstrel's cap, saying, there, sir. Uh, that's an extraordinary touch of human life, not just for the things that I've said, but these two girls are going off to a public uh, laundry to clean the family's laundry and talking about whether or not they were able to get any additional money for pawning their brother's school books. Uh, Stephen was a very good student. He won a number of books as prizes, a tradition that still continues in many prep schools, uh, private schools and colleges. Uh, and part of their penury is made the more poignant that they have the good sense to pick up the coin and drop it in the beggar's cap saying, there, sir. Uh, it's a remarkable episode, uh, like Blazes Boylan, who uh, in the library episode, or right before the library episode, Bloom only saw as a collection of his, his hat, uh, his trousers, and his uh, uh, spats, here, Molly is reduced to her plump, bare, generous arm out of the window. She doesn't come to the window. She doesn't look out. There's a kind of insouciance about it because despite her generosity, she's involved elsewhere, as it were. 
In the 13th vignette, remember there are 19, there's a poignant scene with another of Stephen's sisters, Dilly, uh, which is probably a nickname for Delia. Dilly, whom Bloom had pitied when he saw her in chapter eight, Lestragonians, as a motherless child. We remember uh, that the mother of the Daedalus girls and family uh, has died, which is what's brought uh, Stephen back uh, to uh, Dublin. That's a historical fact from Joyce's own life. Uh, like Stephen, he refused to pray by his mother's deathbed. Um, her name uh, was uh, May, and in the novel, she's Mary uh, Daedalus. Uh, and also by his going off to school afterwards uh, in, uh, in order to uh, find his vocation, uh, he effectively turned his back on his family which went downhill because without the leavening presence of the mother, this is true of both uh, the Joyce family and the Deadless family, without the leavening presence of the mother, the father's alcoholism and inner rage just um, exploded, kept going on. So uh, the 13th vignette, as Bloom is seen at a bookshop in the 10th vignette, he's looking for books for Molly He's also looking for mildly erotic books, uh, which is his won't. Stephen is perusing books in an outdoor cart, thinking ruefully that he may find some of the books his family pawned for money. Bloom can afford to go to a bookstore. Stephen can only do something on a streetside cart. Uh, he won some of those books as school prizes and uh, knows that his family likely pawned them for money. As he's looking through, he's suddenly addressed by Dilly, whom neither he nor we have seen before this exchange. And now I'm gonna read you a, a, a kind of a paragraph from the novel as written. What are you doing here, Stephen? That's Dilly speaking. And you may have noticed that Joyce does not use quotation marks for direct speech. He introduces them with a long uh, dash. Uh, because he thought that quotation marks distracted from the pleasure of reading the book, and he felt that anyone could recognize with the long dash that it was introducing someone speaking. And that if you were paying attention, you wouldn't need the constant, he said, she said, he said. So what are you doing here, Stephen? Dilly's high shoulders and shabby dress. That is a non-spoken register in Stephen's mind that he recognized his sister from her physiques and her clothing. Another way in which people are reduced to their parts like Boylan or Molly's arm in the way we just saw. He says to himself, shut the book. The book he intends to buy is called How to Win a Woman's Love. Shut the book quick, don't let see. What are you doing, Stephen said. A Stuart face, he's contemplating his sister's face. A Stuart face of none such Charles, lank locks falling at its sides. It glowed as she crouched, feeding the fire with broken boots. He's remembering a scene where she is stoking a fire at home with old shoes. Oh, that, that's my gloss. I told her of Paris, he'd been there, Late lie bed under a quilt of old overcoats, fingering a pinchbeck bracelet, Dan Kelly's token, Nebricata femininum, that is blessed femininity in sort of Spanish Arabic. The point is, he remembers that he told her, his poor impoverished sister, whose face is glowing because she's in front of a fire being stoked by old shoes, of her interest in what he said about Paris. What have you there? Stephen asked. I bought it from the other cart for a penny. She's just received two pennies from her father. She says to her father, I know you have more money. And he denies it. He does have more money, but he denies it. I bought it from the other cart for a penny, Dilly said, laughing nervously. Is it any good? Back in Stephen's head. My eyes, they say she has. Do others see me so? Do I look as needy, as impoverished, as young, as immature as this sister of mine? 
Do others see me so? Quick, far, and daring, shadow of my mind. That is, she's a sister most like Stephen. She's thinking about learning French. He took the coverless book from her hand, Chardonnay's French Primer. What did you buy that for, he asked, to learn French? She nodded, reddening and closing tight her lips. She's embarrassed. And then he says to himself in an act of fraternal kindness, show no surprise, quite natural. Don't make her embarrassed that you think it's a joke that she would try to do this. Here, Stephen said, it's all right. Mind Maggie, one of the sisters, doesn't pawn it on you. I suppose all my books are gone. Some, Dilly said, we had to. I just want to pause for a moment and say, if you are hearing this with new ears uh, because of my reading, I don't mean there's anything spectacular about my reading, but if you get rid of the, the static and the clutter and you experience this very poignant vignette in the midst of a, uh, a whole chapter of vignette, you see the power of Ulysses. So after she says, we pawned some, we had to, he says in his own head, she is drowning. Again, bite, A-G-E-N-B-I-T-A. -E I'll come back to that. Again, bite. Save her. Again, bite. All against us. She will drown me with her eyes and hair. Lank coils of seaward hair round me, my heart, my soul, salt, green, death. So I'm going to pause for a moment. He has thought about drowning in the Proteus chapter, chapter three, which he associates with the death of his mother, who died basically because her lungs drowned from pneumonia. And both uh, uh, Mary and May, the two different versions of the mother, in real life and in the novel, uh, spend their dying months spitting up bile and phlegm. And Stephen, walking along the beach on the sea, thinks of the pun on mer, the French word for mother, uh, M-E-R, sounding like uh, mer, the French word, I'm sorry, the French word for sea, M-E-R, sounding like the French word for mother, uh, mer, and thinks of it because he's just come back from Paris. Uh, so here, Stephen is realizing that as he feels sympathetic to his sister, she will drown him with her. And he says agenbite because he is invoking a phrase, agenbite of inwit, which if you read the novel, you've encountered several times, first times in chapter one. Let me make it clear. When I say if you read the novel, I'm not being snide. I have no expectation that you will read the novel or read all of it. Uh, this is a, a consumer-friendly talk. I only mean that if you have, you might remember that we first hear that phrase invoked in the first chapter when Stephen feels he's being patronized by the Englishman Haynes, who says, uh, oh, I may put together a collection of your witty comments, uh, and he's being patronizing. Agenbite of inwit, which basically means a uh, biting, again, of your internal wit, is the title of a 14th century manual of virtues and vices, and may be translated roughly as remorse of conscience. He says it in the first chapter because he knows that uh, Haynes is trying to be nice to him because he feels bad that he's an Englishman and knows the history of the oppression of the Irish people. But it appears throughout the novel in connection to his guilt about his mother, his guilt about the mother church, his guilt about the abandoning of his family. So after he says this, she is drowning, again by it, save her, again by, that is, he's being pricked by his conscience to want to help her, all against us, us, he sees himself as a member of his family. And then he realizes she will drown me with her, eyes and hair, lank coils of seaweed hair around me, my heart, my soul, salt green death. And I can't be the only person who hears an echo of proof rock in that lank coils of seaweed hair, that the mermaid will sing to us until we drown. And then he says as a single word paragraph, we, that is what the cost of, of thinking of himself 
as an us or a we with his family. Again, bite of inwit, he says. Inwit, again, bite. The biting of my conscience, which is telling me that abandoning my family is wrong. And then the last line of that vignette, misery, misery. That's remarkable. And it's not the only scene that has that kind of concentrated humanity in the book, but it is true that they are uh, things you have to look for. Uh, you could say, why wouldn't Joyce have written a splendid novel with a lot of these details? Well, Portrait of an Artist is more straightforward and Dublin is it is its own way, but it's kind of like asking, why didn't Picasso draw women's faces with one eye on either side of the nose? Why did he, why was he so perverse to make the face look complicated? And I'll say that one answer to that is what the German, uh, formalist critics around the same time that Joyce is writing, thought is something that uh, literature does, that all art does. They used a Russian word that I can't pronounce, but I'll approximate, that is something like ostranyenya. It is, uh, it is re uh, related to the idea of ostracizing. It's uh, translated into English as defamiliarization. And the theory goes that when Picasso draws a face that is disrupted, we both see the face as it should be and the face as it's not. And so by making it unfamiliar, the familiar thing is reconstituted and we to participate in the work of perception. Uh, Picasso has a famous sculpture of a triangular bicycle seat. Everybody knows what that feel, uh, sees like, looks like and maybe feels like. And the handlebars of a bicycle, and he soldered them together so that the triangular seat looked like a head and the handlebars looked like the horns of a steer, of a, of, a, of a skeleton head of a steer. And I showed this once to my class and everybody said, yes, that's right, I, I see it's a steer and I see it's parts of a bicycle, which is the point. And one of the students in the class, I'm gonna bet that he was an athlete, said, well, anybody could do that. Yes, but Picasso, saw the steer in the bicycle and lets us see the bicycle in the steer. There's a way in which Joyce prefers not to write these vignettes in straight order and write a splendid old fashioned kind of novel. He wants to enrich it with the detours of all the things I've been talking about. So in my experience, the reader who does not respond to the wandering rocks is not likely to respond to Ulysses, which in this view is a great big novel of many, many small touches. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Very illuminating. Uh, and actually, uh, the, I, I really liked the Wandering Rocks episode when I got to it, aside from many of the things that you pointed out, um, because also, it seems a, a bit more accessible than some of the more obscure sections of the book. And it's almost, it's almost uh, felt like a little bit of a respite from the difficult parts. So it was very enjoyable. So we have one, uh, we've got one question, really a comment, I think person reacting to your comments about modernism that she says that she would add Wharton's Age of Innocence and House of Mirth to the list of modernist novels which are tying the new with the old. Absolutely. And let me say that I was trying to be suggestive, not exhaustive. Uh, and there are many, many works of art in the 20s and beyond, and not just in, uh, in English. Um, All Quiet on the Western Front uh, by Eric Maria Remarque, published in German from a German combatant in the First World War and translated into English is a great example of modernism. Yes, many, many. And of course, some works of modernism appeared before the First World War and after, but they're very much a product of the Great, of the great War. The Great Gatsby only incidentally refers to the war with respect to uh, it having happened and Gatsby maybe being an officer in it. But when you read the book with the notion that it's a post-war novel, you see that the violence and the uprootedness of people 
all these Midwesterners that have congregated on the east coast of the country, it's very much a post-war novel. And there's a death in the novel that's uh, uh, the result of a traffic accident where a woman's killed by being hit by a car. Uh, and if you've never read the novel, don't remember it, I won't ruin it for you by saying who and when. But the description of what happens to what the car does to her body could be taken out of a, a war novel about somebody on the battlefield. So let me say, since we're almost out of time, uh, that what I will turn to next time in talking about the last three books, and you understand that it's not possible in a mere four hours uh, to give every, every one of the 18 books even glancing attention. But I hope what I did today with Wandering Rocks, uh, one of my favorite books, and uh, Michael, as Michael has suggested, uh, favorite book of many readers, uh, is give you a, a context beyond what I did in the first meeting. So next time we'll talk about the last three books of the novel, Eumaeus, Ithaca, and Penelope in the section that is dedicated to Penelope, uh, so coming home. Uh, it also gives us a chance to talk about how Ulysses uh, tries to give some voice to the power of the female, uh, whether it's Gertie or Mrs. Purefoy or Millie or Penelope or others. And two of the big ideas that I wanna talk about about the book are how it uh, reflects the humanity of the great tradition. Uh, F.R. Levis wrote a book on the great tradition about how the great novels uh, e evoked the classical virtues of, um, of civic life, uh, what makes people good people. And he left Joyce out because he didn't think Joyce uh, was interested in that. He, he thought Joyce was too involved in the pyrotechnics of a uh, fancy novel. And I'm gonna point out uh, that the humanity that you saw in that scene was Stephen's first instincts are to say, what are you, crazy? You're buying a book about French, French language. And then he restrains himself. And in that moment of sympathy, he thinks about actually helping her. He thinks about um, being a we, an us with her. And then he has to resist it because he's fearful as he is so often in the novel. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how humanity, Stephen's flawed humanity, Bloom's generous humanity, Molly's complicated humanity are parts of the book. And then the other big idea I wanna talk about is uh, what you might call the meta, M-E-T-A aspects of the book. That is, it's a book that reminds you everywhere that you're reading a book. Uh, I mentioned this in an earlier lecture. It's impossible to read Ulysses and be caught up in the verisimilitude, the realism of what's going on. There are all these shifts that keep reminding you that you're reading a novel in the same way if you've ever been in a theater. You remember movie theaters? If you've ever been in a theater and you notice that the rain in the scene has made a drop on the lens of the camera and you see a drop uh, between you and the characters and all of a sudden you remember, oh yeah, this someone's filming this. Well, if you were remembering in every frame of a movie that it was a movie, you wouldn't enjoy the movie. You give yourself over to the suspension of disbelief and you believe when you're seeing a realistic movie, when you're reading a novel by Jane Austen or Dickens or many, many other writers, that you're experiencing something like real life. Joyce does not want you to have that experience. And next time I'll talk about why. That's certainly one of the other big ticket items of what it's like to read Ulysses. Thank you, Michael. Fantastic, Mark. Uh, really looking forward to next week. Great setup for that. I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Uh, so everybody, have a nice rest of the weekend, and uh, we'll see you next Saturday. Thank you all again for coming. Bye-bye now, folks.